Kimmer Hall, Hula Dunya, Bajagu, Eel Scots, the Celtic Podcast. On today's show, we'll introduce you to possessive adjectives in the Pekimich Beck and Gallic. We will talk about Glencoe in our Celtic history segment, and I'll tell you about the Irish political establishment and how it's getting nervous about the political party Sinn Féin. We'll do that in everyday Celtic ways. Throughout the program today, you're going to hear music from the uh, Selkie Girls and Marianne uh, Kennedy. You'll hear from a group called the Scottish Music Club. And, uh, yeah. And as is always, a wee bit of Irish trivia test your knowledge to start us off. So, uh, during which years did the Irish potato famine take place? All right. Now... I always let you know, check out Gaelic for Sesmox on Facebook for your daily Gaelic and your news feed. Remember, learngaelic.net, it's a great resource for all your Gaelic learning. And anybody that's interested in a uh, weekly Scottish Gaelic class, uh, go check out the St. Louis Gaelic Facebook page, uh, comment, and let me know. La goes me by na ya fallin on low rovio or na so rovio iri horo va o goro shana kam sa va na shala fallin on low rovio or na so rovio iri horo va o goro Fallen on Fallen on low, row 
That was Gaelic song by the Silky Girls. And now, Hot and Tom are fucking much back in Gaelic. It's time for Let's Try a Little Gaelic. Disclaimer, all oh, I need to give you is, uh, I need to let you know that I'm not. I do not represent myself as an authority on the Gaelic language. Only someone who loves learning it and who wants to help others in their journey of learning Gaelic. What I teach comes right from the textbooks of well-respected Gaelic teachers. I'm just trying to make something interesting, informative, and fun. So today we're going to discuss possessive adjectives. And as always, I will display on the screen what I'm discussing. So, toxic shin, let's begin. Possessive adjectives. Yeah. Mo is one of them, and it means my. It also unites the next word. That puts an H behind the then you have the next word. Do means your. One night's the next word as well. And then you're going to have this odd little thing where it's a, just an A. And it means his. Now the one for his, one night's the next word. The one for her is just an A as well. And it means her, but it doesn't one night. And that's how you tell the difference. Alright, then we have R for or. The A R for hour. There, that's better. We have ur or vur for your. I guess that's in the, the plural. Uh, it doesn't note it here, but that's usually how this this goes. Is often used following a word ending in a vowel. Then, of course, you have an. Now, some examples of this is mohota my coat dohota your coat uh hota his coat uh kota her coat our kota our coat ur kota your coat and and kota their coat all right when the word be, uh, following begins with a vowel the following forms are used. So you get the word Ernigich begins with an A. So my money would be in Merigich. And then Derigich, your money. And then remember those two with just the A. This is what happens here. You have just the apostrophe Ernigich, which is his money. And then you have 
a kind of gets her money with an H. Now, the apostrophe before a noun beginning with a vowel indicates the loss of the possessive adjective his and is not always used in the written language. All right. The uh, Alright, the move on here. We're gonna R Nevigich, our money, your Nevigich, your money, and N Erigich, their money. Okay. The T or the N, and of course the, the UR and dash are frequently substituted by the ARH and the URH respectively in the spoken language, particularly in the Lewis dialect. Now, possessive adjectives are used in preference to the prepositional pronouns of ek when expressing close personal associations, that is, um, kinship, parts of the body, etc. What they're saying is that this form is preferred to the way you've been taught already. It's a more advanced way of speaking. Um, Mahota is preferred to in Kota Akam. So they both mean my coat. And Dohu is preferred to in Ku Eket, your dog. They both mean the same thing. Uh, now this is kind of odd. It's a skull is preferred to and skull Eka, his skull, or a skull is preferred to and skull Ika, her skull. Now, there's no lenition there because it's SG. So because there's no lenition with SG on the his or her school, where the ambiguity exists, you must use the prepositional pronoun to avoid confusion and to indicate possession. Alright, we're going to move past that and get on with some vocabulary here. So, we've got ban, which is fair or blonde, care, which is wrong, and kirsch, which is right, tra, which is early, buya, which is yellow, we got guma, which is well or rather fairly, is is ant, it's the same as agus, aher, which is father, coffee, which is of course coffee, pure, Sister, Raher, brother, hospital, or hospital, and Maher, the brother. Alright, got a few sentences here for you to translate. Number one, Hamahota or Salak. Number two, Mahot, Gumam, Bakban. Number three, Haniel and Banya, Akam Number four, Ambu du Bahar, Ado Amakanot. Five, Ha and Nicholas, Aaron Strach, Haran Shin. Six, Ambiek, Dohu, Aruch, Hansafark. And that's it for Beckovich Beck and Gallic.
feeling very peevish His cry was sad and sore Kicked the tinker with his hobnails Knocked him through Tom Murphy's door He galloped off to meet his father The tallest man you ever did see Tapped him gently with his knuckles And now he's missing two front teeth Hold I the happy calling man with you I'll go, I said Never mind the priest this very morn Tonight we'll sleep in Murphy's shed Take your hands off red-haired Mary She and I are to be wed we were with priests this very morn Tonight we lie in our marriage bed Round the corner came a peeler Told him I had broke the law The donkey kicked him on the kneecap He fell down and broke his jaw Through the fair we roamed together His black eye and my red hair Gazing gaily at the tinker Weren't we the happy pair Take your hands off red-haired Mary She and I are to be wed We were with priests this very morn Tonight we lie in our marriage bed off red-haired Mary, she and I are to be wed. We were with the priests this very morn. Tonight we light our marriage bed. That was Red-Haired Mary by the Selkie Girls. Next, we'll delve into the rich history of the Celtic past and the Celtic history break. Today's topic is Glencoe. Now, Glencoe was the scene of one of the most infamous massacres in Scottish history. Almost 328 years ago, um, on February 13th of February, yeah, uh, 1692. The Clan MacDonald of Glencoe were slaughtered while they slept by Captain Robert Campbell and his men. The day is imprinted in Scottish history, not only because of the number of people who lost their lives, but because of the men had enjoyed their victims' hospitality in the days leading up to the massacre. Glencoe had been home to the MacDonald clan, or McKeans, as they were more specifically known. Since the early 14th century, they had supported King Robert the Bruce. Now, the massacre can only be understood within the mind of the Highlander in their deep-seated resistance to an alien southern government. The Highland people were once the majority of Scotland's population, a warrior society that had largely um, helped to establish and maintain their own clan monarchies. Now, the society, tribal and feudal, could not change itself to meet the changing world, nor did it wish to, and that would eventually lead to its own demise. Highlanders were regarded by lowlanders as an obstacle in the way of the complete political union between England and Scotland. Many believed that their independence of spirit had to be broken in order for a union, and therefore prosperity, to come to fruition. Uh, most importantly, Clan MacDonald was not in agreement with Clan Campbell and clashed frequently over their growing support of the government. The McDonald's of Glencoe were victims of what Highlanders called Mirun Mor Nagal, the Lowlanders' great hatred. Uh, the two clans previously had troubled encounters as McDonald's were routinely involved in trouble 
with the law and neighboring clans, mostly the Campbells, who sided and sought the favor of the English government. At the time, many Highland clans were large and powerful enough to pose a possible threat to the new regime in London under King William of Orange. If the clans were ever to unite and focus their efforts into defeating the English, it would be an easily won war. But alas, the clans are so invested in their bitter infighting that the, that kind of union could never happen. Even 63 year, years after, Bonnie Prince Charlie could only garner less than a third of the clan's support, and even that was almost enough to defeat the English. So it's a secure... <coughs> So to secure support and avoid this possible prospect, it was ordered that all clan chiefs must sign an oath of allegiance to King William by January 1st, 1692, or the clans would be punished with the utmost extremity of the law, as he wrote. Now, some clans were already bound by other oaths to James Stewart, the deposed king in France, an oath that they worked released from until December 28th, a few days before the cutoff point for King William's ultimatum. Now, Secretary of State John Dalrymple, Master of Stair, who was a lowlander and a Protestant, used the predicament to serve his own political ends. He used Highlanders as a hindrance to Scotland and went against their whole way of life. His dislike for the Macdonalds and Glencoe was particularly strong. The McDonald's had always been a powerful clan, and their chief called the McDonald's chief was called the Lord of the Isles, and ruled their land like a separate country sometimes. The chief of the McDonald clan eventually took his oath to Fort William, but when he arrived was told that he would uh, have to travel some seventy miles to see the sheriff in Inverary and in Argyle, since no sheriff was at Fort William. Now, due to bad weather and misdirection, the Chieftain McIan arrived after the deadline. However, the Sheriff took the oath anyway for MacDonald, and MacDonald returned to his lands in the belief that he had fulfilled his duty. The oath wasn't accepted, though, by John Dalrymple, and the orders were given for a regiment of soldiers to march to Glencoe and await orders. Three commanders, two from Campbell-dominated Argyle Regiment and one from Fort William were expected to carry out the orders. However, two companies of soldiers never arrived due to bad weather. Some historians believe this was a deliberate act of defiance to avoid being involved in the atrocity. Now, the soldiers and the MacDonald clan lived together for 12 days before early in the morning on February 13th, a rider came into Glencoe and delivered further orders. For the McDonald's to be slaughtered and to be cut off root and branch. The slaughtering took place immediately while many were still asleep in their beds. Before the order, they had shared homes with the McDonald's and enjoyed each other's hospitality. And on February 13th, the massacre took place and left 38 clan members dead. Some managed to escape into the mountains, but subsequently succumbed to the bad weather as it was a fierce winter that year, while others were alerted to the coming events by a few merciful Campbells and managed to gather belongings to protect them from the cold and flee their homes. The events shocked the country and became a powerful piece of anti-government propaganda for the Jacobites in Edinburgh for years to come. In 1695, it was noted that others who had been late in taking the oath had been excused and that King William had demanded that the McDonald's be extirpated, extirpated, a request that had been taken to the extreme by John Dalrymple because of his deep-seated hatred for the McDonald's. Despite his clear act of inhumanity, he resigned, and he was forgotten by the government and everybody else, and never brought to trial, so there was never any justice. Texts published since the massacre have argued that the Campbells can't be held wholly responsible for the tragedy, as the offer in charge was just following orders, which had to obey because 
otherwise they put them to death. So, <clears throat> however, though, to this day, no Campbell signs can be found in shops and homes within the highlands. When I was in Glencoe in May of 2002, we stopped and looked and took the long walk up the Erie Path to the spire and the memorial of the Glencoe Massacre. The fact that this monument is so well cared for and had a few visitors while we were there leads me to believe that deep-seated sentiment still resides in many a Highland heart for the tragedy that happened here so long ago. All right, that's it for the Celtic History Break.
All right, that was Shane Hodel, Shane by Mary and Kennedy. And now it's time for our everyday Celtic ways. A look at how our Celtic characters is still very much a part of our everyday lives. Today we're going to tell you about Ireland's political establishment and how it's nervous about the surge in support for Sinn Féin. Now, the 2020 general, Irish general election will be held um, on Saturday the 8th, February 2020. It will be held at a time when the Ireland's electorate have become increasingly dissatisfied with the President Fine Gael administration's inability or even unwillingness to deal with a number of important issues such as health care, housing, and crime. The election is called following the dissolution of the Dáil Éireann, the lower house of the Irish legislature. At the election, 159 of 160 Dáil Éireann seats will be contested, even that of the Speaker being re-elected automatically. The present Taoiseach, or Prime Minister, Leo Vertikar, has been subject to increasing criticisms and a fall in popular approval since May of 2016. Fine Gael has led a, a minority government with the support of independent members of Dal Ariane, along with a confidence and supply agreement with the other main political party, Fianna Fail. An arrangement that sees Fianna Fail support the present government in crucial votes in order to allow them to retain power. While Fianna Fail and Fianna Gale are both seen as being center right parties, both grew out of the aftermath of the Irish Civil War and have dominated Irish politics and political life since that time. However, there are signs of an increasingly frustration by the significant portion of the Irish electorate in regard to the performance of these old Civil War parties. Now Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael are seen to be part of the establishment who many also view to have too cozy of an arrangement. Seems to have been made to keep those two parties in power and government, and to keep the thumb of oppression on any party that would rise to contest them. There is now some alarm in these parties as recent polling results showing a surge in support for Sinn Féin. This, Sinn Féin, is the Irish Republican political party active in both the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland. Sinn Féin is one of the two largest parties in Northern Ireland Assembly and the largest nationalist party in that assembly. It is now also the third largest party in the Parliament of the Republic of Ireland at the present time. According to the latest Sunday Business Post, Sinn Féin, led by Mary Lou MacDonald, is even with Fianna Fáil both standing at 24%, while Fianna Gael is trailing slightly behind at 21%. The remaining handful of parties, the Green Party, Labour Party, Socialist Democrats, Independents, and others, they make up the other 35%. Now, whether the surge in support for Sinn Féin translates into votes on Election Day remains to be seen. Needless to say, the parties of the establishment will be working hard to ensure that Sinn Féin is locked out of power if the polls are accurate as so, so as not to interfere with their present cozy arrangement. However, this will not go down well with the increasing number of dissatisfied voters. In Ireland who are now looking for solutions to the many problems that urgently need to be addressed. Irish government has become a quagmire where things only get attention if one of the two parties, Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael, allow it to be. Sinn Féin is working hard to give the people its voice back and may be very well on its way to establishing a third power party in Irish politics. And that's it for Everyday Celtic Ways. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you liked it. I'm trying to keep it interesting, informative, and fun. For me, anytime you can infuse something Celtic into your day, it's a good day. I would like to thank everyone for all the support, kind words, likes, and new subscribers. So, top of love. 
And uh, now before I go, I'm going to give the answer to today's Irish trivia question. And that is, what years were the Irish potato famine? And that was 1845 to 1849. All right. Remember to check out Gallic for Sassanax on Facebook, duolingo.com, learngallic.net, acgaamerica.org, and, of course, my YouTube channel, Yield Scott. All right. Marshall Lee and Dresden, bye for now. And I'm going to let you go with the song, Amazing Grace by the Scottish Music Club. Thank you.